They're coming for your property rights, my friends. And right now, it's mostly affecting black people. And I guess if it's not a white cop as a perp, no one cares. But they're coming for them. And it'll slowly go into poor white people. And then it'll go to the rest of us as well. And uh, this, this, this whole thing about... It's just such a freaking... It's so frustrating because what they're doing is they're, they, the powers that be, whoever it is, and we know the media controls things, but who controls the media? And you get a pretty good gauge. They turn the blacks against the cops who are enforcing the rules that the politicians have put into place. So we get things where you have Black Lives Matter that is just grifters. There's taking the righteous indignation of some regular black people with the cops, not just police brutality, but just a, a, a system that's corrupt as all can be. And they're transferring that to create this ha hatred uh, against the cops, which then the whites automatically defend. They say the cops are our side. It's just this whole, it's, it's a complete, I don't want to say false flag, it's just complete corruption. I tell you, man, people who don't know history fall for this stuff. Keep the poor blacks and the poor whites, the middle class blacks and middle class class whites uh, keep them at, at in fighting distance and that way these guys up here can can continue to rule the roost all right so we're going to start with this right here this is freaking insane homeowner suing michigan county over home equity theft all right so this this is from the epic times but i'm going to read it via um uh, zero hedge all right a court uh, had dismissed this lady's claim that the local government in Michigan seized her family's home over a tax debt and then refused to compensate her for the home equity in the property that she had lost because it was sold. All right. The unfavorable, let's see. The case is about a city using a predatory tax law as an engine for its other government purposes and is to enrich private companies. From Christina Martin, this lady from the Pacific Legal Foundation, which is similar to Institute for Justice, which we'll look at here in just a second. So the government says that since it didn't make any money on the taking, it doesn't have to pay what those property owners had uh, of equity, all right? The bottom line is that the government took these homes that were worth far more than any of the homeowners owed the government, and the government should have to pay just compensation for the surplus that it took. All right, so let's check this out. According to the brief, the county took the homes of eight app appellants to satisfy tax debts in the amounts far below the value of their homes. All right, and then they received a huge windfall at the expense of the homeowners. The only compensation they received, the homeowners, was the forgiveness of the debts. The case goes back several years where Tawanda and Prentice Hall, and I don't know any white women named Tawanda, so I'm assuming they're black, fell behind on the property tax and set up a payment plan with the local government so they would not lose their Southfield, Michigan home where they lived with their children. But Oakland County terminated the Hall's plans when their tax debt stood at $22,000. And foreclose on the loan. So I guess Oakland County said, "Ah, sorry about our contract. We're, we were going to foreclose on the loan." But instead of selling the house at a public auction, paying off the debt, and returning the surplus to the the, the halls, uh, the county used the halls' money to enrich a private company, Southfield Neighborhood Revitalization Initiative, which is managed by the city of Southfield officials. So let's, this is this whole thing is freaking insane. All right. This is freaking nuts. Through a series of legal transactions, the county took the Hall's home in the home of seven other homeowners and transferred it through the city of Southfield to the revitalization initiative, which sold it for more than 300,000 bucks. The Hall's received none of the difference between the debt they owed and the sales price. The public private arrangement was established in 2016 by a city resolution. This, this is freaking nuts. So what happens is, Southfield ceases the homes. The Southfield Nonprofit Housing Corporation reimburses the city for the amount of the tax debt and then turns the property over to the for profit revitalization initiative. So, so, where does Southfield get the money to reimburse the city for the debt? So, again, the city forecloses on the homes, all right, because you're 22000 in the rears, even though you have a contract that says you're going to pay it back. They foreclose, they put you out. They, they sell it essentially to the, uh, the nonprofit, which turns around and gives it to this uh, for-profit revitalization initiative for a buck to be fixed up and sold under the idea of gentrification. Um, let's see here. Hold on a second.
The Legal Fund Foundation, the good guys, states that the company generated as much as $10 million from 138 properties from 2016 to 2019 after covering more than $2 million in tax debts. The former, that's $8 million in equity that they got. The former owners of these properties lost everything and received nothing of that $8 million. The for-profit revitalization initiative. Uh, that's shocking to the conscious. The saga took its toll in the hall. Six months after the family was forced to move, an exhausted and overworked apprentice died from brain injury sustained on an on-the-job fall. PLF argues that a victory in this case would finish what the firm started in uh, Raffaele, uh versus Oakland County when the Michigan Supreme Court ruled unanimously to end home equity theft through government foreclosure. All right, so I just uh, court documents in that case Indica- and indicated that the plaintiff who had bought the rental, uh, whatever. So I just want to see something here. So we're going to look at right here. Oakland County, Michigan Treasurer Robert Whittingberg commented, although the Oakland County's Treasurer's Office does not comment on pending litigation, we place a high priority in helping our residents and business owners to retain their full properties, or retain their properties while complying with Michigan law. Our commitment uh, to the full, our statutory responsibility to prevent tax foreclosures and the loss of ownership is in Oakland County unwavering. So let's take a look at Oakland County. Shall we? Oakland County, one of the largest counties, if not the largest in the state of Michigan, 56% for Sniffy Joe and only 42% for Trumpster. Uh, shocking. Huh? So let's look elsewhere here. All right, so here we go. Here's the Southfield Neighborhood Initiative, Southfield Revitalization. Let's see who's in charge of this guy. Uh, let's take a look. Southfield, the center of it all. Yeah, right. Uh, I saw his name was uh, L. Carr at the Southfield Housing Corporation, Businesses, Government, Dashboard, Contact Us. So where do we find one sec? Frederick Zorn, he's the uh, agent for South, uh, whoever this Southfield Neighborhood Revitalization Initiative. Um, very active in other housing things here. I'm not sure what that's about. That's kind of odd to me, but let's keep looking here. So city back efforts sold Southfield homes for millions. Ex-owners are, I would think, Mad, you think? So let's take a look at who's Southfield, Michigan. Let's take a look at Southfield, Michigan. Let's just get a gander of what their city council looks like. Uh, I guarantee they're not. Uh, we're going to look at Southfield, Michigan. Is that, oh, uh, let's see, right here. Southfield, Michigan. And there's more to this story. Hang tight there, my friends. Uh, 71,000 people live in Southfield. It's a northern suburb of Detroit. It shares a southern border with Detroit. All right. So let's just look at the demographics of Southfield. And uh, we'll see the people getting robbed. Uh, uh, let's see. 75, 70% black, uh, 25% white. And so sadly, a lot of the blacks are going to say the whites are doing this to us when it's the blacks doing it to themselves. And then sadly, when the blacks get mad at the cops or enforcing these, putting people out and stuff like that, the blacks are going to blame the cops and the whites are going to go to their natural defense and say the cops are our, our side. It's, it's just such a freaking, it's so frustrating. Both these people are being played. Uh, let's take a look at South, let's see, this Southfield, uh, Michigan City Council. Let's take a look. Southfield, because again, I want to hear Black Lives Matter. No, they don't matter if, uh, if you can get money from City Council. Uh, if you can get money from blacks, apparently, as long as you're in the know, as long as you're in the know, man, if you're in the know, you'll get money and everybody else can go freaking pound sand. All right. So let's take a look at the elected officials. Here we go. Let's look at the elected officials. Ah, look at, oh, we got black lady. Ah, I can't tell what this guy is. Oh, look at, ah, okay. So we got some blacks, a bunch of, all right, but we got Lowenberg. He's not black. Can't tell what the mayor is. One second. Can't tell who the mayor is. Kenson Siver. Uh, point being, why aren't you guys freaking voting these people out, man? You know why? Because it doesn't affect most of you guys until they come to get you. Let's see the uh, related links. State Kyra Bolden. That's the thing that ticks me off. Is like until it affects you, you don't care. Michigan House Democrats. Yep. So she's. It's all Democrats. All Democrats. You know it. I know it. Everybody knows it. It's insane. They don't care. All right, so let's uh, let's keep going. What makes it the most angry is that people are being enriched off the plight of these poor people. It's freaking nuts, man. And no one cares unless it happens to them. Oh, but the hits just keep coming. So let's go to here now. We're going to go to the Institute for Justice. Um, these guys right here. Chicago Impound. The Windy City tows the cars of innocent people and holds their uh, vehicles for ransom. 
Jerome Davis and Veronica Walter Davis, Walker Davis did absolutely nothing wrong, yet lost their car to a system that made them feel like criminals. Their car was impounded by the city of Chicago, which tolls, tows and holds tens of thousands of vehicles each year. I'm going to show you. Look at this. This is the impound for the city of Chicago. Look at that. The city sells one in four towed vehicles. It pays a contractor with residence cars, yet the city barely makes money. You know who makes money is the contractor. I guarantee the contractor is donating big bucks to the Chicago City Council. Uh, vehicles can be impounded for littering, playing music too loudly, or other offenses. To get their vehicle back, car owners face a lengthy process, including multiple hearings, hefty administrative penalties, and rapidly mounting towing and storage fees. The innocent and guilty alike are facing this expensive uphill battle. The Davises took their car to an auto repair shop where an employee decided to take it for a joyride. When Chicago police stopped the employee and found out he was driving on a revoked license, they impounded their car. The Davises tried to show the city that they were innocent, but it did not matter. The city told the Davises that they still had to pay the fine, towing and, mountain, towing and storage fees, after saving up to pay the more than $1,000 owed, they went to pick up the car, but they discovered the city had already gotten rid of it, whether by selling it for, crap or at, uh, for scrap or at auction. The Davises, unfortunately, not only the innocent, were not the only innocent uh, vehicle owners harmed by the Chicago's in, inbound racket. Spencer Bird is a part-time mechanic who stopped for a broken turn single, who was stopped for a broken turn single while giving a client a ride. Unbeknownst to Spencer, his client was carrying drugs. Police found nothing on Spencer, but they still arrested him, impounded his car. He was released without any charges, but he too discovered they could not sue, use the fact of his innocence to get his car back. All right, so check this out. So even after a judge ordered that Spencer's car be returned, the city will not comply until Spencer pays the total towing and storage fee that have mounted since the seizure, which is $17,000. All right, so then we have other people who had uh, car loans on their cars that got impounded. The Chicago, and they were innocent. They got their cars impounded. They had to pay 4000 bucks in fees. They owed $17,000, $18,000, dollars on it. Chicago sold it to who? They're gonna I'm gonna show you right here. It's insane. They sold it to we're gonna go to uh the majority of cars were sold off to a single towing contractor, United Road Towing Towing. I guarantee United Road Towing is uh, very big in the Chicago City politics. Isn't that weird? All right. Last year, uh let's see, many tows are what uh, let's see. Uh Last year, Chicago improperly towed a wheelchair lift van belonging to a woman with multiple sclerosis. The city then sold the van valued at fifteen thousand to URT for fifteen bucks. Yeah, uh, she had MS. The city sold it that was valued at fifteen thousand to URT for fifteen bucks. So let's just say she owed a debt on that prop on that car, right? Let's just say she owed a debt. Chicago's sorry, we're not going to pay it off. You have a debt, you still got to pay our bills. Like, but you you were wrong. You should never have done that. Sucks to be you. This is property rights. It's under assault. Oh, you think it stops there? Check this out. Permits in St. Paul are down 80% since the city passed rent control. Rent control is a taking from the landlord to the, I hate to say the subtenant, because what happens in a lot of these places is it gets leased from one initial tenant to other, to other, to other. So basically it never leaves the hands of the original tenant. That way they can keep the rent low. It's freaking insane. But the landlord doesn't get paid. I was just talking to my daughter about this yesterday. I say, you realize what rent is, you know, it's easy to fall into the, we need to increase the minimum wage. We need to increase rent control. It's easy to fall into that. But then when you start laying out, say, what if you're the landlord? Well, the landlord should do, should charge a better fee. Well, he's got to pay it because what happens is he's got to charge whatever he can charge. He's the one with all the risk. And the rent control just basically takes money from the landlord, and the landlord has no incentive to fix it up or anything because they're getting below market rents. But the, the landlords get below market rents. You know who's not? It's the tenant who's subletting it out. That's what happens. All right, so St. Paul, because they're idiots, passed rent control last year, and is that exactly the consequences that were predicted before it's passed. If you set a price below market value, you increase demand relative to supply, worsening the very shortages the price control is meant to fix, and then you get what? Inflation. Shocking. As I always say, public policy is what causes inflation, not Jerome Powell. St. Paul's rent control ordinance was especially, especially bad policy. 
It contained a unique provision for national rent control, for a national rent control policy. There was no exception for new housing construction. Typically, in order to make sure that new homes still get financed and built, rent control policies only apply to older apartments, either exempting buildings for a certain period of time or only including buildings being built before a certain date. The policy laid out in St. Paul referendum had no such exception. So if you're going to oh, if you're going to build something, you have a you, you can only charge a certain amount of money. You're not going to get paid back. You're, you're, you're going to lose money. So why would you do that? All right. So that's not bad enough. Um, uh, what was the conventional wisdom true that the rent control would reduce housing construction? Uh, and if so, to what degree, or is it possible to apply rent control to a new housing without impacting the new apartments in cities like St. Paul needs? Yeah. Within three months of data on the books since the passage of the measure, uh, results are grim for anyone hoping for new apartment buildings in St. Paul, uh, compared to the same period of the previous year, multifamily building permits are down over 80%. <sighs> Meanwhile, Minneapolis overall construction is up as the economy has rebound, which surprises me. I'm surprised. Anyways, uh, it's going to keep coming. Hold on a second. And a housing expert says the government could use emergency powers to compel the use of unoccupied properties for refugees. Warcan Sir was speaking as around 5,500 Ukrainian refugees has been welcomed into Ireland. Earlier this month, the government predicted as many as 20,000 might chose, choose to flee to Ireland. All right. Uh, the host family thing is probably a short-term measure, really. In construction housing, we can't build enough housing for ourselves. So what you do in a situation is you reach for the low-hanging fruit. And the low-hanging fruit is existing unoccupied housing. That could be student accommodation. It could be built-to-rent apartments that are finished. It could be institutional things. But we've got 62,000 unoccupied housing that's in good shape that we can access. We had an emergency powers during the emergency from 1939 to 1946. It allows the government to do many, many things without seeking permission of the owners. All right. I'm not saying that we should do it for free, but I would suggest a flat rate of what it's just a freaking. I got this from my man, Dave Cullen, over at uh, uh, computingforever.com. Um, on top of that right here, uh, I want to show you something else right here. The independent, uh, wealthy Swedes ask to rehouse asylum seekers, uh, Irish, there will be new incentives for older people to downsize and free up homes for families. Eh, I never heard that before. So let's take a little, one other look here. All right. So the Irish is probably going to hold a, uh, a referendum on the constitutional right to housing. It's certain to the Constitution a right to house. It's that the uh, it comes as let's see the government's housing for all plan contained a commitment to establish a housing commission that would bring forward proposals for referendum. It established a referendum. The Constitution. Let's see. Uh, they don't really. We've. A, all right, I want this going to be one of those. We're dealing with. Okay. We we're dealing with the short and medium term issues around affordability, homelessness, and social housing throughout the housing for all. But we need to look further. What should a stable housing sector in Ireland look like? A very important step would be to assure in the Constitution that Irish have the right to house. As someone who's involved in negotiations, uh, the government will hold a referendum on housing. All right, one second. All right, so it doesn't mean that people get keys in the morning and everybody's provided with a home, but it means there's an actual obligation for the government to do that. Um <laughs> Six out of 10 Irish people believe the right to housing should be enshrined in the Constitution. Um, it's freaking insane, man. And here they're going to argue right here. It touches upon our core matters such as social policy, and that's much different to all kinds of rights we protect in the Irish Constitution. The only other right like this is a, is a right to free primary education. So a right to a house. Yeah, what could possibly go wrong? Um <laughs> Do you not know what happens? They're going to say, hey, your houses are too big. You have to, yeah, it just, it's insane. It's the worldwide, you will own nothing and be happy. And you think it's just liberals. They, they phrase it correctly in the referendum and people fall for it. Like freaking, it's just like shooting fish in a barrel. I'm just telling you, man, this is the biggest. Property rights are the only reason the West has been so financially successful. Freedom of speech has nothing to do with it. Property rights. Of course, the Second Amendment protects the first 100%, but property rights, your ability to have uh, to own things and to do with it as you wish, as long as you're not harming other people, is the, is the fundamental uh, land. Land. You couldn't own land back in the fief days, the fiefdom times. 
land rights, property rights. Now, again, for those who say, you know, anarchist, anarcho-capitalist, well, you still need a government to police up property rights. And this is where it gets scary because a government over here is what we need over here to make sure our property rights are adhered to. But the government over here is being pushed by the citizens to say, yeah, screw your property rights, as was happening in Chicago and Ferguson, Missouri, as in what's happening up there in Michigan, all over the country, man. Um, at the end of the day, the government is going to do what the citizens demand. <laughs> the citizens demand six and ten Irish want an affordable right to house. What the hell does that mean? It just sounds good. Nuts. I will right, we'll see you.